couple of armchair GMs who have yet to be wrong with any of their Timberwolves takes. <laughs> right. It's Flagrant Howls with Phil Mackey and Kyle Tyke. We promise for however long this episode lasts, whether it's 30 minutes, 40 minutes, we will give you the same high-intensity effort and energy level, the clamps, if you will, that Anthony Edwards and Jaden McDaniels gave two of the most prolific scorers in modern NBA history. That's right. One of, I'm just going to say this. We'll just kick it off like this. I may or may not have done mushrooms in college once. (laughs) And that feeling is how that entire game felt last night. Um, Obviously, we just started this pod at the last play. But going back, the three best quarters I've seen Rudy Gobert play in his Timberwolves tenure, um, a lot of that had to do with Mike Conley. Um, Just finding these little ways to get Rudy Gobert open. Also, too, just an enormous amount of credit. That guy, Kyrie Irving, gets uh, criticized a lot off the court, probably rightfully so. But on the court, I've never seen anyone play basketball like him. He was a one-man wrecking crew in that fourth quarter. He hit some shots in chaos where he looks like he is just so calm. And then to wrap it all up by having two guys that are 21 and 22, not only force Luka or Kyrie, who basically played a two-man game, not only force them to take a bad shot, that's one thing. They didn't even let them take a shot. That is generational defense right there. To not only just say, you're not even going to get the ball thrown at the rim. Incredible clamps, incredible lockdown performance. Michael Grady on the call, go back and listen to it. He was great. Yeah. Is great. Um, big win, big time performance. And as they said in the huddle right before that play, Finch said, do you guys want to, do you want to, you know, the modern day, do you want to foul up three? Do you want to drag this game out? And they're like, nah, we're here to, we can score and we can defend. Let's defend and See, I think I actually interpreted because Anthony Edwards did the uh, the interview with Bally Sports North after yep. the game was over. And then, of course, <laughs> to cap the night off, then he goes and like takes pictures and signs an autograph with a little kid who had the number one Anthony Edwards yep. sign. You know, big smile, kissing some babies, playing clamps defense on Kyrie. Just another night at the office for all star Anthony Edwards since the last time we did it. We jumped on. Yes. Um, I th- so, so he was asked by by Katie Storm about the last sequence. And I thought he said Finch wanted us or Finch asked us to foul. I think and I think Finch has kind of it's now it's kind of being made into like he asked the players that they wanted to foul. Okay. I think Finch might have asked them to foul and they and not in like a malicious way. And they went rogue a little bit because the possession kind of when Jaden tipped the ball away, that changed the possession. Yep. Because exactly. now it's Good like, call. OK, now it's chaos. Should we still foul? God, they're in the backcourt now. Should we still foul? So I think they went a little rogue. They were maybe supposed to foul, but then Jaden gets a hand on the, was it the inbounds pass or the second pass, yep. whatever it was, and then they decide, well, now it's chaos. Let's just clamp these guys in chaos and see what happens. And it flustered Kyrie, who was incredible in the fourth so, quarter. So good. It was less of a Wolves meltdown and more of Kyrie Irving just hitting. It was just like NBA jam. The ball is on fire for 15 minutes level of hot streak by him. That That's a good comp. There is, I don't know the specific play, but it was nine adults on the court all losing their minds. The Wolves had, I think, maybe turned it over or missed a shot or something. And Kyrie just sprint dribbles up court, crossover behind the back, and then just kind of randomly pulls up right at the top of the key for three to hit it. And it was just, it was like watching everyone else in fast motion and Kyrie was in slow. It was incredible. And again, had a couple people be like, well, you know, they blew that lead or they were outscored by 56 to 31 or something down the stretch. It's like, that's just really, truly the NBA at this level. Um, You had two of the best guards in the league just making shot after shot. But for the Wolves to just prevent, you know, a complete collapse and, again, do it in a way that they did it by not just, like, forcing them to take a bad shot, but just being like, you're not even going to get a shot off. Um, For all my gripes about national coverage uh the wolves were everywhere last night uh on twitter i mean jj reddick was talking about him hollinger was talking about him they were like oh my god like uh that anthony edwards kid like if he's gonna play two ways like that it's time to re reassess where we put him in kind of the the 25 under 25 rankings did you see who else was talking about the wolves on twitter last night Um, somebody else who had his eye on the old squad last night my guy ryan rosillo no, did he tweet about he had the a really, He had a really good tweet. Uh, why don't you tell me yours, and I'll, I'll find this one from Rosillo. This man tweeted, Wolves tightened up the laces on D. Don't underestimate oh. culture shifters, right? Dot, dot, dot. That would be Kevin Garnett. 
we got to get that handle change from Kevin Garnett 5 kg to Kevin Garnett 21 kg and get that thing up in the rafters at some point. But Kevin that's the Garnett... first time I've seen him comment on the Timberwolves this season. Yeah, he had a thing done like on video recently, or maybe he was talking about putting Ant in the All Star game, and then this like okay. I don't know, just uh, put a pin in this. Like I, I, he started to talk about this team a little more. Um, I've always been under the assumption that maybe when this ownership layaway program is completed later this year, <laughs> that uh, when there's new people running running the team, that Kevin Garnett might be more open to coming back. So um, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if a jersey retirement is going to happen in 2023, but I think that's on Mark Laurie's short list of things to get done in 2024. So yeah. just, just something just, to keep an eye on. But um, just, uh, KG just chilling at home, watching you know the young Timberwolves put the clamps on Luca and and Kyrie. Um, what was your give me like your one sentence or one take takeaway from that game last night? That's the second game since they made the trade, and we'll get more into the last time you guys heard from us on Flagrant Howls was sort of the emergency. Oh my God! They just <laughs> they just made a blockbuster trade. So we'll get more in depth like, now that we've thought about it for a few days. But now that you watch, they had a chance to sit, have dinner together, practice on the road. The first game with Conley was like, all right, it's a mad rush. This just happened. Um, what is your one sentence main takeaway from that game last night? The Timberwolves did not in- did not end up trading away their future for Rudy Gobert. Mm-hmm. That would be my one sentence. Okay. Because the future of the Minnesota Timberwolves last night was on full display with 20-some seconds left as it clamped down two of the best all-star guards in the league. Um, the future of the Minnesota Timberwolves is not draft picks and trade swaps, or in draft swaps. The future of the Minnesota Timberwolves is Jaden McDaniels and Anthony Edwards. It yes. is that simple. They are two of the best two-way players in the league. I mean, not only did Jaden have the clamps last night, I think he scored 18 points. Um, was very eight shots. Yep. Was very efficient (laughs) in doing so. Um, The future of the Minnesota Timberwolves, despite what they've traded for Gobert, despite what they might do with Carl, whether keeping him or not keeping him, you know, over the next five years, the future of the Minnesota Timberwolves is Jaden McDaniels and Anthony Edwards on full display last night, both ways scoring, you know, playmaking, shutting down all stars. Uh, it was impressive. What was your one sentence? I like that one. My one sentence is there's an adult in the room and his name is Mike Conley. So, and and then if I could give you a secondary sentence, or maybe I can do like a comma, and <laughs> he's definitely not washed up. These no. people, oh I don't know, like maybe it's just I always probably put too much stock into the noise on Twitter because I love Twitter and Instagram yep. and stuff, but it's only a sampling of people. The number of people who haven't apparently watched Conley or, or, are, or are just assuming because he was part of a, a rebuilding jazz team or something, right? Like that he's washed up or because he's 35 years old. Maybe he's not the same player he was five years ago, but that dude can still play. He can still orchestrate offense. Uh, he can still knock down a three-pointer as needed. He hit three of them last night, and he can still give you 30 solid minutes. Is he, if, like, if you just go player for player, who is the more skilled, better player straight up skill-wise? D'Angelo Russell right now, although I, I don't think the gap is as wide as some people would, some of the D'Lo defenders would like you to think. But if you're going to give me who is the best fit and basketball player to organize this team as a point guard, to get the best out of Rudy Gobert, to get the best out of Anthony Edwards, Jaden McDaniels, etc., to be a calming presence when the opposing team is making a run, all these different things. Not that D'Lo didn't provide some of that stuff. This it doesn't have to be a trash D'Lo uh, session. Um, but Mike Conley brings more for this team than D'Lo does without the picks and the contract and all the other stuff. And I said that on Thursday. I feel like I got clowned by people like, oh, man, you're a casual. No, you're a casual. You're a casual. <laughs> if you think that because you know, D'Lo puts up 20 points that he's you know, the savior or something, Look what happened last night. LeBron's out. Okay, so D'Lo gets to play with Anthony Davis and Jared Vanderbilt and some other decent players. They got freaking smoked last night. Unless they came back from down twenty no. after old Macadac went I to think, bed or something. I think Dame had a uh, like thirty at half. No, yeah. you know we're let's start drinking again. We're back to small sample size theater where you have this brand new point guard who is a big part of everything you're doing both ways. But he didn't play in the Utah game, right? That was last. That was the night we did kind of the emergency trade thing. The Wolves crushed the Jazz. The Memphis game, I think Mike Conley told Chris Hine of the Star Tribune it was one of the three most chaotic days of his life. That's a lot. It's a lot to 
get traded, join a new team. You're also in a an familiar know, place. Doesn't like know Memphis. any of the, the play sets or anything. Like never played with any of these players. Yeah. And tough. guess what? Memphis is just really good, and that might just be a bugaboo team that the Wolves don't want to mess around with. But then again, last night in Dallas, it just seems like the pace with or without Mike Conley, because they didn't have him against the Jazz, but the pace that this team plays at without D'Lo, again, I think D'Angelo Russell's a really good player. And if he's a, built in a team, I had mentioned this last week, like with the Clippers and now with the Lakers, that maybe slows it down a little bit. I mean, LeBron James' teams don't run. They're more methodical. That might be more for D'Lo. But this team, despite a 30-year-old Rudy Gobert and Kyle Anderson, it's still really young. It's still a really young team. Like, go look at the box score last night. All the guys that are contributing are 21, 22, 24, 26. Like, the team that's just still very young. So to add an adult in there who also understands the importance of kind of getting the ball moving around a little bit, not so yeah. dribble heavy. Uh, I felt like Mike Conley took nine dribbles last night. Um, but I will say, because you said the, word, the A word, adults, you're right, you're right, you're right. But anytime you're going to say adults for these next two months, you also have to include Kyle Anderson. Because yeah. he was... I'm a big fan of rewatching games. I rewatched it this morning. That fourth quarter, Kyle Anderson was screaming at people to just chill out. <laughs> like, everyone was running around with their head cut off. Kyrie's doing his thing. And Kyle Anderson was the guy that slowed them down, and got a couple the, buckets. He, he let the primal scream out. And then, like, 30 seconds later, he picked, uh, was picked it Luka Kyrie in the corner. Luka? No, Luka, Luka in the yeah. corner. Like, you never see Luka Doncic get the ball stolen. And to just do that kind of poke around thing that Kyle does, that was a big, big play in the game. Um, also credit to, I mean, credit to Finch. This was a question we had all along with the Rudy Gobert stuff. He, Rudy was again, first three quarters, probably the best of his Timberwolves tenure. And then Finch just said, I'm going to close small. And it worked. Um, I thought Gobert was good on defense, but offensively in the fourth quarter, it was getting to a point where the Mavericks were like, please, please post Rudy up. And the Wolves kind of did, and it stagnated everything. So he just said, screw it. I'm going five guards. Uh, and it, it worked. They got, you know, they gave up some rebounds again, but yeah. For the most part, Finch kind of just said, I'm going to put Gobert on the bench. Gobert sounded like he was okay with it because they won. So all around, the vibes are uh, immaculate you know, right now. That's the thing. Like Last night was kind of a perfect blueprint, both from a, a strategic standpoint and from an ego standpoint, that when you're, when you're paying guys max contracts, it is, it is taboo to even suggest taking them off the court, right? It's like... Mm -hmm. You know, uh, with with those Jazz teams back to back years against, I think it was the Clippers and the Mavericks in the playoffs. When those teams figured out, oh, let's just play small ball, let's just go five out and make Rudy. And it was, again, like smarter people who break down NBA film have pointed out, yeah, there's like there's some Gobert plottingness that leads to those teams having success. But there was also like Utah's perimeter defense was a train wreck. Like if you put yep. Jade McDaniel's out there or Anthony Edwards, I think it's it's probably a different story. Um, but the Wolves decided last night, even with Jade McDaniels and Anthony Edwards, th th we're going to take Gobert off the court. We've seen enough of this run. So why can't it be acceptable? He's making a ton of money. He's going to be out there at the end of most games. But there's going to be some games where he gives you the 9 for 9, 21 points, 14 rebounds, and a plus 17 for the first you know two hours of the game. And then the opposing team finds something with a different lineup, and they're coming back, and it might make sense. There were times where the Lakers would have to pull Shaquille O'Neal off the court because he can't hit free throws. Mm -hmm. I'm not comparing Gobert to prime Shaquille O'Neal, okay? I, I one, was last night, but anyway, one, keep going. <laughs> one of them is one of the greatest centers of all time. The other one is a very good center who's probably overpaid, but whatever. I guess what I'm saying is if it's best for the team that he needs to be off the court for the last five minutes of some games because the opposing team has gone with some sort of a small ball five out lineup, I'm fine with that. Yep. If Gobert's fine with that, then all the better. Like he's the one that would maybe get ruffled, right? But he looked fine after the game. So he dominated and then they pulled him and, and like I don't know why it has to and, be a huge deal, I guess. And I I thought in my little brain that he got played off the court because offensively the Mavs were so small. I mean, there's a, whole, there's a whole conversation to have about this Dallas Mavericks team, by the way. What, Luka and Kyrie combined for 69 points, but also probably gave up 89 points just at the rim. I mean, the Mavs have no yeah. rim protection, whatever. But in that fourth quarter, they just started forcing the Wolves to really act, like include Rudy in post-ups, and that was killing them. And all I thought about during the time was it's like, if you just took Rudy out in that stretch and just put Carl in there, who does have more of a back-to-the-basket game, can punish smaller guys and just post up situations. 
I think they would have maybe closed last night with – so they didn't just close small. I think they could have closed last night with just a different big guy. Yeah. And that, again, because I had some friends, it's like after these big wins, they go, yeah, that was all fun and stuff, but what are they going to do with Carl? I'm kind of excited. Let's see it. Let's see what happens because if you're cool sitting Rudy in certain situations but playing Carl, maybe you sit them both. Like what Finch has showed and last night was big. Game six against the Grizzlies was big when he put Jordan McLaughlin in for D'Lo. He has enough control of that locker room to really just do coaching stuff. Yes. And that's really important uh, for a young team that they buy into that. Rudy said all the right things after the game. So, yeah, just an incredible performance all around, 2-1 and one since the trade. Again, that Memphis team is, is tough, but uh, last night was just also a professional win. That is such a big win for them to then come back home. I think you said it. They had like an 11-game stretch was, was a gauntlet. And I, what did they go? It, they went so it was eleven games against ten Western Conference playoff teams, including like oh top God. teams. Yeah. And the Orlando Magic, who are nineteen and fourteen over the last thirty three games, and the Wolves went seven and four over that stretch. Seven and four. And you can pick the Magic one is fine, but <clears throat> you can pick that Kings game that they lost in overtime that's like, ah, oh, you know what, they probably should have beat them as well. So yeah. um, yeah, I think are the Magic or the Magic are still pretty much in the bottom of the Eastern Conference, but they have been really hot lately. So an incredible performance. Uh, they have one more home game this week against a not very good Wizards team. So it'll be interesting to see with more adults in the room now. Does this team try to you know finish the job before taking a week vacation? Um, and then the schedule is just everyone. I think the Wolves have played more games than anyone in the league. They're thirty-one and twenty-nine. So at sixty games, no one has played more, um, which is also good too because you you mentioned the P word. Um, one of the the themes from this team over the weekend was that they got to practice. <laughs> like we just had the wolves haven't had two off days in between games, I think in 2023 and now they're going to have it twice. So they'll in, probably practice today and or tomorrow leading into the third. They have a, they have a back a home back to back, by the way, a home back to back. And then the rest of the year, they only have seven home games after that. So yeah, well, and I think the home, the, the home back to back, they play the wizards on Thursday and then they have a week off. And then it's Charlotte. You're right. I'm sorry. I read, right? Yes, because it's the All Star break this weekend. You're right. So, I saw the I saw I saw the Thursday Friday, but it's a uh, it's a week apart. But so. but it also goes <laughs> back to my load management rant and all that stuff. Like I really do wonder if at some point we will get to 72 games, because if you're a fan and you're listening to this and you hear the the phrase shoot around all the time, these teams have shoot around every morning before a game. But those shoot arounds, and I've been to a lot of them, are basically what it's like when you and your friends are hung over and go to LA fitness on a Saturday morning. It's just like <laughs> roll in in sweats in a sweatshirt, figure out the game plan, get some shots up, you know, drink a liquid IV and then get back on the bus to take a nap. Um, the importance of practice. I mean, the Wolves schedule and the trade deadline worked out so well to let Conley practice a couple of days. Those practices are hardcore, like high intensity. So yeah. yeah um, all in all, like I said, a, a new chapter has started and uh, one chapter has ended with D'Lo being sent out. A new chapter begins with Mike Conley, and then one more home game. Anthony Edwards All Star. The propaganda we pushed was was answered and listened to, and then you might get Carl back in a week and a half, and then it's just you know a sprint to the finish line. Is that what is the timeline? Uh, so you'll have to excuse old Macadac here. He's been uh, he's been he's been traveling across the country to to come to get closer to Anthony Edwards. I say the Timberwolves like, traded away DeAndre Russell, and then the next morning you packed up your life and moved. We to crossed each other uh, <laughs> over the Rockies, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, there is no firm timeline that I've been told, but I just think that he uh, he's been with the team. He's been doing on court stuff. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Again, this is just complete speculation. I wouldn't be surprised if he does make his appearance at the end of the month. But but we'll see. Again, he's already gone past whatever timeline we thought. But Who getting him back of- for that. West Coast road trip against, like you said, Golden State, the Clippers, the Lakers, the Kings. That would be nice to get him back at some point. It would be. It's it's so crazy. Like where any other team that that w- if we were talking about a first, second, or third team All NBA guy, <laughs> it's crazy. Who shoots like forty percent from downtown is a double double machine. Is this unicorn, highly skilled player? Any other team in the NBA would just be counting down the days. Oh my God! Th- thank God that guy is going to come back on, you know, circle the date. But I feel like it's it's more of a walking on eggshells, anxious feeling for Wolves fans because it's, it, it, it's some of it's because we've seen how Carl can, when he gets into his moods or when he starts to, when the emotional intelligence drains a little bit, you know, he can he can derail a good thing. He can also be the catalyst for great stretches of basketball. 
But it, it feels like they have something so different happening here with Anthony Edwards as the clear alpha on the court. Mike Conley in the mix now. You know, Gobert and the chemistry with Conley. I don't know, man. I guess my long rambling point here is I don't know what to expect. Is he going to be able to slide in? Because in a perfect world, hey, Kat, you're going to come in here. Things are a lot different now than they were like three or four months ago. But if you can just be a compliment to these guys for now and figure out your role, or does it have to be, hey, everything's centered around Carl Anthony Towns now? I don't know what, what this is going to look like. <laughs> that That's obviously TBD. Um I, this is just an optimistic take, but I, one of the reasons I like Carl, I think, a little more than others is because, again, he, by most accounts, when you make multiple all-star teams, when you are all-NBA, you are deemed a superstar, and you can have levels of superstardom, but he's just never been the guy that's demanded the trade. He's never been the drama guy. He has been the guy that has opened up his arms to many different coaches and many different star players when Jimmy was here and you know D'Lo was here, his best friend and all stuff. I don't know. It, it's TBD for sure. Um, it always reminds me of the Kevin Love fit out, fit in thing, but I just think kind of like you now that you're back in a different area code. Um, yeah. I do wonder if he's just coming back to something that's so different that he'll just be open to new things. I mean, this is, he's not going to come back to the same Anthony Edwards, the Anthony Edwards he left in Washington was by his account more than anyone, an out of shape, little pudgy, you know, didn't really come into camp in great shape, took a couple weeks. He's going to have a brand new point guard. Rudy Gobert totally understands his fit more. The Kyle Anderson stuff has blossomed. Um, so we'll see. I mean, yeah, but does he come in and kind yeah. of the, the vibes I just said were immaculate? Does he come in and demand too much stuff or take too many shots away? But I do think Carl, for the most part, has shown an ability. He did earlier in the season. He's like, I will make sure Rudy gets fed. Um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I just I think it's great. There are stretches with this team still where it's like against the Grizzlies. How do we score? If Ant's not on the floor, yeah. Conley's great. Jaden, you know, is getting unleashed a little more. But how do we really? Last night, the reason that the Mavs had that comeback, I think the Wolves went eight straight possessions without a bucket. I don't think that happens with Carl on the court. So it got I, really cloggy there. With like you had go, I think at one point you had Gobert, Jaden, and Kyle Anderson on the court at the same time, mm-hmm. and, and not like and and two of those guys can hit threes, but it just gets kind of cloggy when mm-hmm. when there are certain lineup combinations out there. I mean, I just think that a second unit led by Carl and then maybe a Kyle Anderson and other guys that fit around him, it's just you can kind of lean on Carl for a while. You see that with other, you know, tandems or trios around the league where one guy Are you guy bringing Carl up. off the bench? No, stop. No. No, I, I think— Dude, Steph Curry came off the bench a couple of years ago, right? Didn't, didn't Steph Curry come out not like for the— I think it was like a—that was a way to—maybe Carl will for like a minutes restriction thing because it's easier to restrict minutes when you're controlling the sub-patterns, but— uh. No, I, I mean, I kind of thought last night, unless Kyle Anderson's just way more hurt than we think, and that guy needs a week off. Uh, last night, Kyle Anderson, for the most part, was was clean on the injury report, and they started Torian Prince anyway. Yeah. And to me, that kind of was like maybe the tell of like, okay, that's going to be Carl's spot, because they kind of started TP at like the four. Um, that's where you're going to slide in Carl, move Kyle to his six-man role. He'll be the first guy off the bench, and he'll probably sub in for one of the bigs, right? Like yeah. Kyle will sub in for Rudy. Then he'll have Carl, and then they'll sub Carl out and put Rudy back in. So the the, the best thing right. is is that this team has treaded water. They had a professional win last night. And no matter how it works, the Daryl Morey philosophy of talent always wins, or talent is, you know, it's harder to get talent than trade it away. Just have more talent. Let Finch figure it out. And then if it doesn't work, then you can make more moves this summer or next fall and make a bunch of more trades. Yes. Um, now that we've had a few days to, to think more on the D'Lo trade, <laughs> For Conley, and uh, I love how all of the second-round picks were traded in the NBA on Thursday last week. Literally every <laughs> last future second-round pick was traded in the NBA. Most of them um, for James Wiseman, who was drafted yeah. second overall behind Anthony Edwards. That's right. What a steal. I saw you clapping, correctly so, by the way, <laughs> on Twitter. Um, what are your – the other big development, I guess, was some of the, the additional reporting. Mm. Um, John Krasinski from The Athletic went on uh, Dan Barrero's radio show on KFAN and – talk more about what he knew about some of the internal chemistry and strife issues where you had, and I'm just kind of, you know, this is me paraphrasing what how, what John was paraphrasing, but that there were times where D'Lo would just be openly like mocking and poking at Rudy Gobert, both on the court in the locker room, that there was like this uncomfortable vibe between D'Lo and Gobert and 
Gobert and maybe some other guys too. That it, it just something was off, and you could tell too. Even with that come to Jesus um, New Year's Eve meeting after they dropped that game to the to the Pistons, and Nas Reed came out a day or two later and said, "I I I know exactly what the problem is. You know, I'm not going to elaborate on it, but I I wonder if it was not that D'Lo was the problem, but like D'Lo Gobert lack of chemistry stuff that gets fixed by putting Mike Conley in that spot. I think th- some of that stuff coming out was really interesting." To me, and another sign that, yep, sorry, D'Lo, you can't be. Ju- if things aren't going the way that you want, you can't just like start making fun of your teammates and mm-hmm. creating bad chemistry and like, be, be an adult to use that word for the mm-hmm. umpteenth time on this episode. Yeah, and one of the clarifications or kind of follow ups John Krasinski had, who is obviously one of the best co- people covering this team in general, is that uh, it wasn't like a toxic situation, like a Jimmy Butler thing, um, and. I mean, again, I, and this is this is actually a good conversation to have because you've mentored me a lot in this realm and in this industry, and like you used to cover the twins, and like you were there every day. Um, there is this weird fine line because I saw some people in John's mentions being like, "Well, why did you just dump all this stuff out now? Why aren't you reporting this in real time?" I'm not a reporter, but I knew some of that stuff. It kind of goes back to when the Gerson Rosas thing kind of blew up. Like as soon as that tweet came out, I remember saying right then, like, I wouldn't be surprised if Sasha gets the job. That's because yeah. you kind of heard that behind the scenes. But again, to any young person listening, like reporting in general doesn't sound fun. I wouldn't want to do it. You have to have so many sources and carry water for people. But I'm curious what what it was like for you because I, I mean, I'm doing it right now. I am not a journalist <laughs> by any means, yeah. but I'm in this industry or this realm and I'm doing stuff. And I think sometimes we think that the reporters we follow or the people we listen to and read are just telling us everything they know. And it's like, that's, not the They're not. case. Yeah, this is a really I, I love I love this uh, this type of industry sort of peel yeah. back the curtain discussion. So, um I would not currently at all consider myself a journalist. I would consider myself a uh, uh, a talking idiot. I have a microphone. <laughs> Same. <laughs> and we are we are entertainers more than we are journalists on Flagrant Howls and Mackie and Judd and Purple Daily. Do do I and we have connections that sometimes leads to information? Of course, am I looking to actively report on things? No, I am not. There was a time in my career, and I'm I'm only talking about myself here because I want to shed some light on sort of what you're getting at. Um, there was a time earlier in my career where I absolutely was a capital J sports journalist. I was a beat writer covering the Minnesota Twins from 2010 through 2013. Uh, so my my job at 1500 ESPN Radio at the time was sort of split 50-50. Cover the Twins as a writer, even on the road, not every road trip, but like travel with the team at times and report on the team, good or bad. And then the other part of my job was a three-hour radio show with Patrick Royce in which it's less reporting, it's more opinion and entertainment. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it was hard for me in that position when, you know, when – when you're a beat writer, you need them to give you information. Mm-hmm. They need you zero. Mm-hmm. Not zero, I guess. They they need you to maybe paint a, a, a picture of something in a positive way once in a while to help their situation. But the hardest dynamic is you need information from people. Yep. They need very little from you. Mm-hmm. And so to keep that relationship alive, it's on you to not just burn the whole bridge down. And there was a couple times with like the 2011, 2012 twins that were that, a 99 loss team, a 96 loss team, I think, where I wrote some pretty inflammatory, inflammatory in their eyes, things mm-hmm. about the organization, things, things about like players not respecting certain uh, people in authority or like just different things behind the scenes that the, the audience would want to know. My job as a beat writer is to serve the audience. You want information mm-hmm. about your favorite team. Mm-hmm. Well, it's hard when you're trying to keep relationships internally alive, but also maybe be critical or out certain things that are only internal right now that you may know about, right? Because you're around the team every day. And then if there's another level too, where you're also like trying to be entertaining and give opinions on a microphone, like you can't just play close to the vest. So um, I guess this is all a roundabout long way of saying it's really hard to do those jobs. So you might catch wind of certain things in a locker room or internally that if you were to bring to light, you would lose 
certain parts of your access or Mm -hmm. you would burn certain relationships. So you have to be careful about playing those cards if you're in those jobs. But at the same time, you owe it to the audience to play those cards because they deserve to know what's happening. That is your job. Right. Um, I don't love that some of the things that came out about D'Lo and Gobert came out after he was traded when maybe that information would have served fans um, in the weeks or months leading up to the trade. But I understand how hard it is if you know something and if you report it, all of a sudden now, like, you just lit a fire that is hard to put out. So I'm kind of conflicted. Like, I, and I'm not, like, piling, because it's, I'm not just, like, piling on I think the, it's the a D-Lo good thing. conversation, though. So I'm glad you kind of shed some light on it, because I remember, too, like, when the, when the Ryan Saunders thing was going really bad, I wrote like this piece at the time over at, at Canis where I was just like, it was like an open letter to Gerson Rosas. And it was I remember about, that, yeah. about as critical as I could be. But the beauty of it was I wrote it from like my patio out in Portland, Oregon, right? Like I didn't have yeah. to see that dude ever. He didn't really like me anyway after some of the things I tweeted. But mm-hmm. for some of these other people, like this is like anyone listening, this is going, if you're a teacher, this is going to school every day. Like John Krasinski, all these people, they go to work every day and their office is Target Center. Their office is these locker rooms. So I just wanted to bring it up because it was some interesting stuff, some things I'd heard, some things I had not. And it is a balancing act of like, if nothing else, I've learned, again, I'm not a journalist, you and I don't pretend to be, but we have some, I've learned a lot from Chris Hine, I've learned a lot from Dane. Uh, It's a balancing act of reporting things, but also there's just stuff that you'll never be able to report, Yeah. (laughs) right? And you use that information sometimes more so to make takes or not even takes, but to like make opinions because you know some stuff like that was... I had just been hearing for weeks that it's like they do really want to move this guy. They 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 don't want to sign him this summer. The numbers are yeah. so different from what he might want, from what they might want. So that's why I kept saying, like, you know, I think they kind of have to trade him because they're not going to extend him. And then they did. But I didn't know any ideas that were on the table or any offers. So yeah. it's a weird, it's a weird game. Um, it's weird because we're all like, you know, Wolf's Twitter, I'm one of them. Like we all want as much info as possible, but we also don't tweet at, you know. Dr. Fam, who's my dentist, about criticizing the way he does stuff like we do criticizing <laughs> reporters or criticizing right. people that do stuff. So an in- interesting stuff that came out. I thought he, John was pretty honest. And a- he's, an, an, he's an incredible reporter. And incredible. He, he knows where everybody is buried inside the organization. He will write a book and, one day. He will yeah. write a book one day. That, and that's, <laughs> too, like the, the, the books you see, like, why did so-and-so write the Michael Jordan book? 15 years after he retired, the statute of limitations were pretty much up finally that you could dump all that stuff, right? So, yeah, uh, yeah some of the stuff I'd heard, um, I, I think the, the players still really enjoyed D'Lo, um, but I just think they wanted a new voice. And this is more so, again, about just empowering, like I said to you and, and Judd last week, this is about empowering Anthony Edwards to just be even more of a focal point, be the yeah. louder voice in the room. Um, it's why I question sometimes the Pat Bev stuff I mean, he was just bought out by the Magic the other day. It's like, I love Pat Bev. One of the best years of my life. But college was also some of the best times of my life, and I would never go back to being a college student. <laughs> I would rather just have an income. So Yeah, the Pat Bev thing, I don't even know who's – I'm don't. i I'm not looking to, like, get rid of – I mean, maybe, maybe he could take, like, Jalen Noel's minutes, but, I mean, Jalen Noel has shown recently that he's kind of coming around a little bit. So I want to see him play next time. I, I don't know if there's a place for Pat Beverly. You'd have to point. not only find minutes for him in a team now that, like, where we love Mike Conley and Jordan McLaughlin is a they fan gotta find favorite. Cat, Cat's got to take minutes <laughs> right. from somebody at some point. We also have to find a roster spot. And I'm a biased but big Austin Rivers fan. So then it's like, well, then your only other real option is, like, Nate Knight. And I don't yeah. know. I like Nate's developmental, you know, potential. Um, You can't cut, like, a Matt Ryan. You can't cut a two-way guy to, to put bring Pat Bevin. So... Yeah, just, I mean, a whirlwind of a seismic shift at point guard that obviously answers the question for this year, but also maybe for next year. Um, a couple of really big wins on the road against Western Conference teams. I mean, the Jazz just won't go away. That's super annoying. They traded half their team away, and they just keep winning. Um, so this is just going to be a 22, starting on Thursday, 22-game sprint to the finish line, and there's so much to still figure out, right? Like, you, you're bringing in this all-NBA guy. Where is he going to fit? Anthony, JJ Reddick said it last night. Like Anthony Edwards has taken the full leap, like the full leap. Um, he is doing the jaw stuff now, and he's defending too. So, 
it's pretty crazy blast, times. Man. Pretty crazy times. And then, yeah, we traded you uh, back to Minnesota. So the, <laughs> the party starts now. Can I tell you, so, uh, on this reporting angle, uh, I want to tell you, a, a qu- I don't know if it applies or not, yeah, but sure. it's, a, it's a story that mm-hmm. I think kind of tells you uh, like what happens when you ruffle feathers. If you were to go out of line or something and, and, uh, and piss a bunch of people off, I, I can't remember what exact year this was. It was like 10 or 11 years ago. It was uh, toward the end of the Ron Gardenhire run. I can't remember. I think they may have like fired a couple coaches one year and then, or let some contracts expire. And then they did like one or two more years with Gardy and then into Paul Molitor or something. I can't remember the timeline, but I remember at the end of one of those 90 plus loss seasons, I had received some information that they were going to let a few specific coaches go at the end of the year. And that there was also, there were some young players in the clubhouse that weren't taking the work as seriously as some of the veterans wanted them to, that there's like this sort of lackadaisical group of players that they skimped on the dress code. Mm -hmm. They, they, they were just sort of happy to be major leaguers. Right. And there was some, some coaching stuff and some cultural stuff that had gotten, gotten out of hand. And that's part of the reason why the twins were no longer a division champion team. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote it. I didn't like embarrass anyone, but I wrote that these, you know, according to sources, here are the coaches that have expiring contracts, the twin. And I didn't say, like, they're gone, they're worthless. It was, I worded it in a very, like, couched way that was, here are coaches that have expiring contracts. The twins are likely to shake up the staff sort mm-hmm. of a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, didn't name any players specifically, but there are young players. Here are some specific anecdotes about anonymous players, right? I walked in, and this is what you're talking about. You can write something from Portland. And that's great. Uh, when you have to walk into a locker room or a clubhouse, it can be different. And I remember mm-hmm. the next day I walked into the clubhouse and one of the PR people came up and said, head on a swivel today. And I was like, <laughs> what are they going to like? Are they going to accost me? What, yeah. What's going to happen? Are they, am I going to get physically assaulted by somebody? Is Michael Kadire going to take a bat to my shoulder blades? I don't even remember if he was still on the team at that point. But, <laughs> um, but um, a couple of the co- – like one of the coaches – pulled me in, not physically, but like wanted to speak with me in a side room, took 10 minutes to light me up for who told you that? Why would you, why would you report that? This is my life. We're talking about this. And I said, I don't know what to tell you. I understand why you're mad Mm -hmm. that this information's out there now, but the fans are pissed that this team keeps losing 90 games. Yep. There are reasons why this team is losing 90 games. I would like to be friendly with you, but it's not my job to be your friend. It's my mm-hmm. job to report information to fans, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, Ron Gardenhire himself actually pulled me into his office and said, um, boy, you got a lot of people mad in that clubhouse over <laughs> this information. I said, is, I said, is anything that I reported untrue? He said, no, it is not. Yeah. He goes, but I, I don't love the way that you gathered the information. I said, well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, you can't just be like walking around eavesdropping on conversation. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. That is not how this works. And I had to sort of explain where I was coming from. Like, no, you have people and I, I can't tell you who because then I'm airing them out. But you have people that are pissed about the way things are operating behind the scenes. You have people that are pissed about young players and people that are pissed about some of the coaches. They are using guys like me as an outlet to get the information out yep, there. Yep, yep. That's how that, and I had to kind of explain that, and we had a great back and forth, and like, have been fine ever since. Um, but it's tricky; it can be really tricky, in that those guys don't want things out. The team doesn't want D'Lo <laughs> go bear stuff out. It's a Venn diagram, but, but, and right? like you have to decide how much do you want to disseminate. You can you can portray that oh, it's not the greatest chemistry behind the scenes, but how specific are you going to be? Are you going to mm-hmm. report on the exact thing that you heard in the hallway as one of them walked by the other? You know. It is a. Uh, it, I'm I'm kind of glad I don't do that for a living anymore, <laughs> dude. <'cause it's laughs> that, that's really my. That's the one thing I try to anyone who I try to help people that want to get into this, whatever I do, still. But like, that's one of the things is like you can make a name for yourself and cover teams and do all stuff without reporting. Like you can still get clout or I don't know, send good. Like you just don't. The reporting thing sounds so weird because the Venn diagram of it all is like these teams want nothing out. Ideally, they just want every. Like they're so insulated. These teams, unless and, it's a big positive. Like, you know, yes, press look release. how awesome we are type yeah, thing. Yeah, so but, they want nothing yeah. out. And as a fan, myself included, you want 100% of it out. And then if you're a media person, you're in the middle. So, I mean, I remember, too, I was at all those playoff games, Wolves, Grizzlies. 
Uh, that's when Ant kind of had his knee thing, right, throughout the whole series. And uh, I'll never forget, I was in the back hallway, and at Target Center, the, the Wolves and the opposing team are on the same hallway, just separated by 50 to 75 feet. And Ja Moran and Ant were having this really cool back and forth after the game. I think Ja was like, "How you know, your knee okay? Kind of jawing each other a little bit, but in a really fun way that was like, this is so cool. I wish this was recorded. I remember Chris Hine like tweeted something out about a oh, really cool moment here, Ja and Ant checking on each other's health. And it was like so uplifting and positive. And Ja found the tweet and like put the, the blue cap on it. It was like, this didn't happen. And everyone just sided with Ja. It was it was literally just like a fun yeah. conversation, thirty seconds in passing. But John Morant like had turned all these people on Chris Hine being like, "Stop making stuff up." It was like, I literally watched that happen, and I can't yeah. record it because <laughs> they don't want. But they don't want it out there. Yeah. But this is like they don't want it out there. So it's a uh, it's and, an and, interesting. And, and John might might say, "I'll never talk to you again," kind of a thing. But yeah, it's it's tough. Yeah, it's and then John got in his truck with the red dot. But no, it was uh it was just it, it's a it's an interesting situation. It was one of the talking points I wanted to bring up because it was kind of dominated. You know, Wolf's Twitter on Friday and Saturday was just yeah. the, 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 the reporting of it in general, but also, you know, why doesn't this stuff come out? And just as I've learned, there's just stuff that might never come out. But uh, yeah. it also isn't wrong for a fan to be like, I want to know as much as possible. So a crazy week, a crazy week. I'm so glad the trade deadline is done. Um, obviously, D'Lo's out. Mike Conley's in. Nas Reed is still here. Jalen Noel is still here. This team has so many <laughs> questions to still answer. Right, like they yes. they they're gonna have a massive massive off season, no matter how this season kind of wraps up. But uh, you've had you've seen a couple really big time offensive performances. You've seen a better version of Rudy. Whether Mike Conley just gets him more on the court, or maybe just gets him more off the court uh, as a human being. But um, there's no time to rest. Again, if you look at the schedule, which I know we're kind of gonna do now, it's like they got one I would say easy game at home, and then it's a 21 game sprint to the finish line. And you have to win every possible game you can because it's all Clippers, you know, Kings, uh, Golden State, Kings, Suns. So it's going to be a fun, fun, like, next two months of basketball for this team. Yes, and we'll do more of a scheduled dive. Uh, you know, maybe we'll do one more episode probably later this week yeah. before the All-Star break. Um, we got to get going for now, but my God, that was fun last night. What a fun so- basketball game. Mike Conley, maybe that was the peak. I don't know. But Mike Conley as the straw that stirs the drink for Rudy, Anthony Edwards, and Jade McDaniels. Uh, this is going to be a fun stretch in a clumped Western Conference. He's Kyle. I am Phil. Thank you for hanging out with us on your favorite Timberwolves lifestyle podcast, Flagrant Howls.